Hello, thank you for joining us on Washington Talk. I'm Connie Kim. North Korea launched rockets for the first time this year as part of its firepower strike drill. The U.S. hasn't shown much of a response to the launches, with the president saying it has no reaction to short-range missiles. Is the U.S. trying to maintain the status quo on North Korea? No, I have no reaction. Short-term missiles, no. No. None. In the studio with me is David Sanger, national security correspondent for The New York Times. He's also the author of The Perfect Weapon, War, Sabotage, and Fear in the Cyber Age. It goes inside the rise of cyber warfare and how cyber attacks are reshaping global power. Also joining me is Scott Snyder, a senior fellow for Korea Studies and director of the program on U.S.-Korea policy at the Council on Foreign Relations. His book, South Korea at the Crossroads, charts the evolution of Seoul's foreign policy and strategic choices. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Connie. Great Welcome. to be here. Welcome. Thanks. Now, Scott, I want to start off with you. So we've seen North Korea's first rocket launches for the first time this year. And this comes at a time when North Korea is trying to prevent the spread of the coronavirus. So what do you think North Korea's intentions were here? Well, they're, they're picking up where they left off. This is uh, the season of the uh, winter training cycle. And so maybe the most significant aspect of this test is that it shows that they are maybe moving from testing to trying to deploy. Uh, and also, uh, they're also working on the uh, ability to conduct simultaneous or near simultaneous tests uh, of different types of systems. Mm -hmm. So do you think this rocket launches were focused on the military aspects in terms of upping their military capabilities and maintaining their military posture? Or do you think it, it would have had some other intentions? Well, I think it certainly is, is part of maintaining the military posture against the South. Uh, it does, has a relatively limited utility, Connie, for sent message sending to the United States other than to provide a low-level message sending signaling effort. Um, the most interesting thing about the past two months is what uh, Chairman Kim did not do, which was that he did not launch the kind of resumption of, a, of an ICBM or intermediate range missile that was the kind that he ceased at the end of 2017. And had he done that, I think we probably would be in a new era. And they're sort of weighing at this moment, what do you do to try to get President Trump off of the current status quo, but how do you do it without provoking something that might make the president feel in the middle of an election campaign here in the United States that he has to show a, a much uh, more active response, go back to the fire and fury language and all that. And so they're trying to walk this extremely fine line. Mm. And President Trump did say that he doesn't have any comments. He doesn't have any reactions to North Korea's short-term missiles. Um, and the State Department just didn't go beyond saying that we're, we're urging North Korea to avoid provocations and come back to the negotiations. So why are they showing this kind of a response? I think they're stuck at, at this point. They were betting that the North Koreans would come back in the course of the negotiations. That hasn't happened yet in any significant way. Um, and they're trying to dance around the fact that North Korea is continuing to produce its nuclear material at basically the same rate that it was producing it before the Singapore agreement. Remember the objective here. At just before he was inaugurated, President Trump tweeted out and then said, I will solve this problem. And he's no place closer to solving it, it looks to me, than his predecessors were. 
David mentioned that it seems that the U.S. is stuck in the current negotiations. Then do you think this stance from the U.S. will continue until the U.S. presidential election? Well, I think that what the, the North Koreans really have a couple of options here. You know, one is to provoke, uh, but uh, the risk in provocation is they, they don't want to lose the personal relationship, which kind of serves as a guardrail against total disaster uh, and returning fully to fire and fury. Uh, but at the same time, um, they uh, don't want to be ignored. Uh, and so they're trying to walk through that uh, and figure out whether there's a way to, uh, to move things forward. But I actually also think that uh, the North Koreans have already signaled that they're hunkering down and waiting for 2021. Mm -hmm. uh, and so in that sense, uh, it's possible that nothing will happen. But Trump has shown that um, he prefers the status quo. Mm -hmm. So it seems like the U.S. is trying to maintain the status quo on North Korea. Um, then since, that, since you've been covering the White House for a very long time, is there very little appetite within the administration to push for another U.S.-North Korea summit before the election? I, I don't see any uh, appetite except maybe from the president himself mm -hmm. because the president likes the pageantry of summits. He likes being seen as the first president who's ever met a North Korean leader. Um, he likes emphasizing the relationship, and the summit's the only public way to go do that. What he doesn't like is the nitty-gritty of getting into the negotiations and trying to figure out what we might have to give in return for the North Koreans giving something, which, of course, would bring him back to the approach that many of his predecessors took, Barack Obama, George W. Bush, uh, and, of course, Bill Clinton through the 1994 uh, agreement. So. That's why I said before that I think he is feeling pretty stuck here. But even President Trump said a few weeks ago that he didn't sort of see another summit coming. And I know that he's been advised not to go attempt one mm -hmm. unless they had a real breakthrough ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Speaking of getting advice from the administration, do you think after John Bolton has left the administration, the administration's approach on North Korea softened in any way? I haven't noticed a big change. The rhetoric coming out of the White House has softened or basically just sort of not been there. You haven't had this tension between the president obviously following one policy and his national security advisor taking a much more hardline view. Uh, I thought it was interesting that soon after Mr. Bolton left office, um, he uh, immediately said uh, that he thought this was going to be a failure. And I, I know when he was national security advisor and you'd talk to him about uh, North Korea or you'd hear interviews from him or something, you'd always hear him begin the sentence, well, the president believes, well, the president says, mm. which was Mr. Bolton's way of saying that he didn't believe that any of this would work. So clearly John Bolton was a hardliner on North Korea. Are there moderates and hardliners coexisting in the administration right now? I would say that there are hardliners in Secretary Pompeo, who recognizes they need to make a, a real piece of progress. You've seen continued sanctions on North Korea, not at a super high level, but you've seen them. And then there are people who are basically giving up playing on this issue, right, who don't believe that there's a whole lot of progress to be made and are focusing on, on other things. Well, I would say that it doesn't matter whether there are hardliners or moderates on North Korea as long as North Korea is not willing to engage. Mm -hmm. It really is inconsequential. Uh, the, the debate that could have occurred uh, within the U.S. about how to deal with North Korea has not occurred because the North Koreans haven't shown themselves to be serious. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Singer, you've previously written an article criticizing that the President Trump's original team has been replaced to his royalists. Um, do you think that Secretary Pompeo then would be a figure that could counter the president's impulsive uh, intentions? Well, it's interesting that at Hanoi, from as best as we can put it together, and I was there uh, reporting at the time, that um, John Bolton and Secretary Pompeo, two people who didn't get along terribly well and didn't always agree on everything, both urged the president not to take the deal that mm. Chairman Kim put on the table. Um, and, of course, the president ultimately did not take that deal. Uh, if there was another meeting, if there, this kind of decision came up again, I have no reason to believe that Secretary Pompeo's view would have changed. 
Mm -hmm. I want to take a look at how an official from the administration has said that it's going to take a slow, patient and steady diplomacy on North Korea. So do you see this any different from the Obama administration's pa uh, strategic patience? There's some interesting similarities there. I mean, basically, what you, when people talk about strategic patience, it basically means that there's not a politically viable option mm -hmm. that can be pursued in order to effectively address a problem. And so I do think that there are some similarities between uh, the way that the Obama administration perceived uh, North Korea uh, at the time of strategic patience uh, and the current situation. I don't see a huge uh, difference. The Obama administration also felt stuck and their view was basically keep the sanctions on, eventually the North Koreans will come around and crack. Didn't happen in President Obama's time. And I don't see any particular evidence that it would happen now because this period of sort of status quo, no big provocations on the part of the North Koreans, is striking the Russians and the Chinese as just fine. Mm -hmm. And I want to shift our focus to South Korea for a bit. Um, so we've seen a letter from Kim Jong-un to South Korean President Moon Jae-in saying that it offers condolences to the South Korean public battling with the coronavirus. But this comes just a day after his sister has slammed the South Korean presidential office for criticizing for expressing concern of its rocket launches. It seems like there is confusion within South Korea over this. So how should we read into this? Well, this is a little bit complicated because it's the first time that we've seen a Kim family member come out in public uh, and make a statement of this sort. Uh, and of course, um, Kim Yo Jong was the emissary who went during the Pyeongchang Olympics uh, and met with Moon Jae-in. And of course, at that time, in the public view, she was actually quite quiet. Um, she didn't make many public statements, uh, but she did have this kind of coy smile on her face that actually, I, I thought it, she looked like she was the cat that ate the canary. Uh, but I think that we have to wait and see. We could be seeing a kind of good cop, bad cop strategy emerging uh, from the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. So it was definitely a rare incident. And it's said that Chairman Kim in his letter expressed position regarding the two Koreas. So going forward, how do you think the two Koreas relations will turn out to be this year? Um, I think the virus may make uh, a bit of a difference. I think what happens in the negotiations between the United States and South Korea, an issue on which Scott's more expert than I am, um, uh, may make uh, some difference along the way. Uh, but I would doubt that you're going to see a significant resumption of the inter-Korean relationship, economic relationship between now and the U.S. presidential election. Mm -hmm. the, the critical issue here is that the, the President Moon has been on such a charm offensive to try to offer the North Koreans something. Uh, resumption of tourism in f some form, uh, preparation in the event that the North Koreans decide they need external help on coronavirus. And so far, the North Koreans have categorically rejected all of those efforts. Uh, so the question is, does this letter signify some kind of turning point or not? So you're seeing there is a little bit of a room where the two Koreas can move towards a cooperative direction. Well, so far, the North Koreans have categorically rejected that possibility. Uh, and we don't have evidence yet uh, that there is a change in direction signified by the letter. Uh, but if North Korea really faces um, severe internal need, uh, I think they will find a way to show flexibility. All right, we'll leave it here for now and move on to our next segment. Let's now watch a video for our next topic. I know there, are, there have been some other sanctions on North Korea uh, associated with cyber crimes that they've done, or, or not, not against them, on actors in North Korea. The U.S. Treasury sanctioned two Chinese nationals for laundering stolen money obtained through a North Korean government-backed hack of a cryptocurrency exchange in 2018. North Korea's cyber hacking capabilities have evolved from attacking Sony pictures to cryptocurrency hacking. We discuss North Korea's cyber capabilities and whether the U.S. can deter these attacks. So, Scott, 
We've seen the U.S. Treasury sanction two individuals that have tar that have helped launder money that was stolen from cryptocurrency exchanges back in 2018. So this is the first time that the Treasury has made such move. What is the significance of this? Well, it shows that the U.S. government is focused on the next step in terms of North Korean sanctions evasion, the one that has um, kind of emerged uh, in terms of North Korea's cyber uh, capabilities. Uh, they're focused in particular on the fact that the North Koreans have essentially robbed the International Bank of about $2 billion. Uh, and uh, this is the mechanism by which um, the North Koreans have been able to try to turn, uh, in particular, the cryptocurrencies into hard currency. Uh, and so it shows that, we're, that the U.S. government is aware of that uh, and is beginning to take some steps in response. Well, mostly it's a recognition of the fact that while we have these negotiations going on on the nuclear program, which um, seem to have echoes of things we've seen for the past 20 years, um, the United States has got to show that it's also interested in the weapon that the North Koreans are using every day. Chairman Kim knows that while he can build up his nuclear arsenal, he could never use it against the United States or one of its allies. That would be the end of the country. He also knows, as the most sophisticated users of cyber weapons know, that cyber is something you can use every single day. And if you keep it below the level of outright war, you're not likely to bring about a significant military response. And so, in some ways, cyber weapons are much more useful to the North Koreans than nuclear weapons are. Nuclear weapons are big and symbolic and put you into a certain club. Mm -hmm. Cyber weapons actually enable you to fund yourself. Mm -hmm. So how do you assess North Korea's current um, cyber uh, capabilities right now? There has been some speculations that North Korea's Christmas gift will involve cyber attacks. Uh, the um, Sony attack took the Obama administration by surprise. It was patient, it was sophisticated, and well, well executed. They've since indicted uh, a North Korean uh, official for being the leader of, of that attack. Is, of course, not somebody ever likely to see the inside of a U.S. courtroom. Um, in more recent times, what the North Koreans have done is they've moved beyond the relatively simple hacks that enabled them to steal money from the Bangladeshi Central Bank, they got caught doing that at the New York Federal Reserve, to these cryptocurrency hacks, which have turned out to be a lot more profitable. The big question is, how are they doing in fending off U.S. responses? Mm -hmm. And you've previously written in your article, quoting um, Recorded Future, that North Korea has improved its capabilities in stealing and mining cryptocurrency over the past three years when the maximum pressure campaign started. So how do you expect North Korea's cyber capabilities to evolve in the future? You mentioned how they evolved in the past earlier. So they're going to be as broad spectrum as they can. So the financial hacks are basically a way in a world in which you would no longer make um, uh, counterfeit currency. Remember, they did some of the best counterfeits of $100 bills. Obviously, you can make a lot more money um, for probably significantly less effort if you can figure out a good cryptocurrency effort. Um, they're even mining their own cryptocurrencies, which you know takes a moderate amount of computing power. Um, the second area that I think you have to go look at is their ability to disrupt U.S. infrastructure. They're watching what the Russians did in the 2016 election. And they're realizing that the soft underbelly of American defenses is that 85% of our internet usage is in the hands of private companies, not in the hands of uh, the government. And therefore, they see there a significant opportunity where they can turn up the heat but they can do it in a very calibrated way, again, to avoid a direct military response. Mm -hmm. so, so the real key here is that North Korea, with its mindset as a guerrilla state, has taken an approach to emerging technologies that tries to monetize technological vulnerability rather than capitalizing on innovation. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the other areas North Korea could be launching attacks on in the future in terms of cyber? Um, well, that's an interesting question. I mean, so far it seems to me that uh, the main focus, broad-gauged, as David said, 
has been on trying to uh, use uh, cyber as uh, a profit area. Uh, and so I, I would be watching more uh, efforts to try to essentially uh, steal money from the international bank in order to fund the regime. And the U.S. vulnerability on cyber attacks is often raised. Is the U.S. capable of deterring these cyber attacks from North Korea? Uh, so there are two main ways that you can uh, deter um, cyber attacks. One is deterrence by denial. That is to say, to build up your defenses so. The problem with that is that because so many of the, of the uh, networks we're trying to protect are in private hands, the government can't mandate just what those levels of, of protection would be. The second major way you can deter them is by showing that there will be a harsh response, not necessarily in the cyber arena. It could be sanctions, could be a military response, could be legal action, all kinds of other possibilities. But so far, the United States has not had a coherent cyber strategy for the return uh, of that. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of countering North Korea's threats, there, are, there is a WMD front and there is a cyber threat. So do you think the administration should put more emphasis on countering North Korea's cyber attacks in addition to eliminating the threats um, coming from WMDs? Well, I think that was the, the main news that David just delivered is mm -hmm. that, uh, we're, that there is a U.S. government strategy uh, that uh, should be uh, focused on doing that. And then the question is going to be whether or not um, it's possible to pull together uh, essentially a strategic framework for effectively managing deterrence in the cyber realm. Mm -hmm. What do you think of the possibility of the U.S. interfering into North Korea's nuclear facilities or nuclear missile, syst uh, missile systems in the future? Well, certainly the U.S. has tried before. It's part of a program called Left of Launch, and it's not limited to North Korea. And the concept of Left of Launch is that you do what you can to interfere with a country's ability to launch a missile rather than just focus on intercepting them. Um, some days this has had successes, some days it has not. And part of the difficulty of doing it in the cyber uh, realm is that your timing has to be precise. You have to get at a missile launch right when it's about to launch or in the days leading up to that. Whereas if you're doing what the North Koreans are doing, cryptocurrency and all that, if you fail this week, you can change your strategy and try again next week. The money's always going to be around to try to steal it. All right, we'll leave it here for now and move on to our next segment. Now time for the photo moment. Time to look at an interesting North Korea photo of the week. Today we have a selfie of Sweden's ambassador to North Korea that he posted on Twitter after foreign diplomats in North Korea were allowed to get out of their compounds following the end of a month-long quarantine over the coronavirus outbreak. He tweeted, I've never been happier standing on Kim Il-sung Square. Russia's embassy also confirmed diplomats and their families were allowed out from March 2nd to visit approved locations. What do you make of this? Uh, I can imagine uh, after having been cooped up on a diplomatic compound mm -hmm. uh, inside of North Korea that being out and about in North Korea would probably be a step forward. But uh, we also know that there is supposed to be uh, an evacuation flight for diplomats uh, to Vladivostok. Uh, scheduled for this week that apparently has been postponed. And so the ultimate next step toward freedom has not yet been realized. <laughs> David? What I note about this is how few other people you see in this photograph. Mm. What does that tell you? Well, for one thing, they didn't want the diplomats running into many ordinary North Koreans. Um, but the second uh, thing it notes is that maybe the ordinary North Koreans are like residents of Seattle and other parts of the United States staying home themselves uh, these days. But the absence of activity in this photo mm. is almost as notable as the picture of the ambassador. All right, I think that's all the time we have today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That does it for today's Washington Talk. And from all of us here at Voice of America, thank you for watching. Do join us again next week. Goodbye.